Great Lakes. Together, they make up 20% of the Earth's uh, surface, uh, surface water. We have Michigan, Superior, Huron, Erie, Ontario. Uh, since the Griffin was lost three centuries ago, 10,000 vessels have been lost on their ways. But this special is about the greatest of them all. Built by, owned by a mutual insurance company and chartered for, until 1983 by Ogilvy Norton. The, the ship name is, of course, the Emma Fitzgerald. Seven, built in 1958, 729 feet long and named after Northwestern's uh, chairman of the board, Emma Fitzgerald. It was built to compete with se uh, several uh, similar freighters in terms of how much load, it could, um, in terms of its length, in terms of how much cargo it could carry. Over its, uh, over its brief 17-year career, it beat its records for the most cargo hauled by a single ship, the first to haul one million tons through the, car, um, through the Sioux Locks. By 1971, it was not the longest freighter on, Le on, the, on the Great Lakes, but it was still the pr uh, pride of, of the Overby Norton, and capped them by the finest, Ernest McSorley, a veteran of 44 seasons, and at 18 had become the youngest master on the lakes. T uh, today I want to tell you about the, f uh, the voyage, its last voyage the w one who would make people think about how, uh, about how, um, how safe our freighters are. For a long time, people thought that uh, we didn't think about uh, freighters of, uh, of such size and stature s sinking in just less than a heartbeat. Right now, I would like to talk about that ship's last voyage. Uh, it started right over here by Duluth Superior, picking up 26,116 tons of taconite pellets. And about right, right here, it accompanied um, the um, Arthur M. Anderson over by Benton Harbors, uh, uh, excuse me, Benton Harbors, Minnesota. And among themselves, they decided that instead of the usual southern, shorter southern route, they would take the longer northern route, which would give them protection from the storm. Um, when the voyage first started out, it was a rel relatively calm lake. But by the morning of November 10th, um, the storm started whipping up in a fury. And then went up, um, as we went up the lake, as by the time we got right about here, the storm really started getting nasty. But still, um, there was no panic. The, the smaller M and Fitzgerald, being the faster of the two vessels, was was ahead of the Anderson by 10, 10 to 20 miles. But by uh, mid-afternoon, the two ships had lost sight of each other. Them and Fitzgerald would never be seen again. Towards, toward, um, by the time they got towards the end of the lake, there were 90, um, the weather report was out 90 per hour our winds and 30-foot waves, and all freighters were asked to sh seek shelter as soon as they could. Problem is, when you get when you get to this point, it's pretty much um, it's pretty much um, no, no, there's no pretty much to go. So Captain McSorley and Cap Captain Bernie Cooper of the Anderson decided that there, there was no choice, but instead make a make a trip for. Um, Whitefish um, Bay. Bay. By the time they got past uh, Michigan Island and Caribou Island, they entered an area known as the Six Phantom Shoal area. Um, 
uh, an area which is uh, terror ship to shreds. A uh, Phantom is um, six feet, so it's 36 of uh, churning water. And Captain Bernie Cooper, after, in an interview, said he was closer than he wanted his own ship to be. And about 310, Captain McSorley reported that he had, he had, um, had lost both his radars, lost a vent, and it developed a star, uh, starboard list. And it asked the Anderson to keep an eye on him. Uh, through the, for the next four hours, Captain Cooper, Captain I, and McSorley. As soon as they, uh, about, 7, 10, about 7 p.m., they cleared Calgary Wynum. And then about 7 t 10 p.m., Captain McSorley asked for another radio fix. And this is an afterthought. Captain Cooper asked, oh, by the way, how are you making out with your problems? And Captain McSorley replied, it's going on like it's, we're holding our own, going like an old shoe, no problems at all. Um, no no um, message was sent from the Fitzgerald after that. About 7.30, a, a call, Captain Co um, Cooper tried to call McSorley, nothing. He desperately um, checked his radar, which had, had lost sight of the Fitzgerald and asked other ships to ch uh, check to make sure um, his radar was working and his radio was working. But they all said it was fine, and none of them could spot the Fitzgerald. Captain Cooper immediately called the Coast Guard and told them that um, them and Fitzgerald had lost, but they brushed it off, thinking that it's probably in safely in Whitefish Bay. But Captain Cooper persistent again tried to call the Coast Guard. They sent out helicopters. Um, helicopters to comb the area, and the Anderson, along with another freighter, the William Clay Ford, was sent out to inspect the area. Um, over a period of a week, they recovered the ship's two lifeboats. Uh, one looked like it had been bitten in half by the teeth of the storm. Several life jackets and other debris, but no bodies and no survivors. About a couple, uh, month or so later, they found two large objects on the bottom of Lake Superior. Um, later that spring, the Curb 3 was sent out to um, exp uh, explore the wreck, and they came out with these um, pictures. Um, this is from the uh, pilot house. Well, anyways, um, this is what the Emma Fitzgerald wreck looks like. Okay. Okay, this is what the Emma Fitzgerald wreck looks like today, 170 feet from each other. All these drawings are from the Coast Guard. This is a bow section picture of the wreck. Um, Oh, by the way, I picked up these drawings from the record of the by Frederick Stonehouse. This is the bow. This is the uh, stern of the wreck. And this is a starboard room. This was one of the big problems of the wreck. The entire wreck was covered with men. A lot of the portions that the Coast Guard needed to see were covered. And here's the uh, stern again. And finally, here's a view of the ship, but you get the idea. When the ship hit the bottom, it had been horribly dam uh, damaged when it hit the bottom, but so far, nobody knows what put it there. Over, over the over years since it sank, there's been several theories about what caused it. Um, Captain Bernie Cooper had said that um, it had broken in uh, either it suffered a stress fracture, in other words, broken too. But it, it, the theory he supports is when it entered the Caribou um, Shoal area uh, that it struck a reef and one was sinking. But the theory that the Coast Guard had presented was that it had folding hatch cover, 
covers that the clamps are a very good clamp, but you have to have a you have to be a real he-man to really get them good and tight. And and some of them were uh, the Coast Guard believes that they got so careless they didn't really tie in, tie enough, and the wire just got into the hatch covers. Um, one, I, I'm sorry, I don't think it really has much merit. It's the so-called three sister theory. That says two waves came on one side, one wave came on the other side, and pushed the ship down. Uh, but so far, every every th every theory that's every kind of theory you can think of has been put forth, but not a single one of them can be pr uh, could have been proven or disproven. All because for one simple reason: this uh, nobody survived the wreck and no one actually witnessed it sink. So it's up to speculation though, as to actually what caused it. Um, Jacques Cousteau in 1980 again explored the wreck. And in uh, 1989, a uh, little robot, little RV, ROV, took uh, color 3D photographs of the wreck. And then um, just last year, the Great Lakes Historical Society decided to bring up the ship's bell and make it a memorial to um, the men who had died and replace it with a brand new bell. One that um, one, one would be centerpiece for a museum at the, the Lighthouse Museum in Paradise, Michigan. Um, the families had requested I had requested it, and it asked that there be no other ex um, other expeditions out uh, of respect for the family. This gives you an idea of how bad um, the, it's the storm. Lake Michigan, I mean, excuse me, Lake Superior and the other Great Lakes have um, uh, have claimed uh, many ships. The Emmon Fitzgerald just happens to be the most recent. The Daniel J. Morrell, the Carl D. Bradley, the Griffin, the Charles S. Price, but none stand out quite like the Emmett Fitzgerald for many reasons. Um, the mysterious circumstances that it's saying. I mean, one minute it was on the radar, the next second it wasn't. Uh, another reason, the mis great mystery that surrounds the thinking, the many theories that have been brought up. But this song probably brings up the memory more, more than that. Excuse me. This song was put out in 1976. It's called Summertime Dream by Gordon Lightfoot. Okay, calling it Gordon Lightfoot. It, it came out a year after um, the ship sank, and he sang a song called, um, called The Wreck of the Emmett Fitzgerald. I wish I could play it for you. I, I just don't want a copyright lawsuit. But anyway, I really would encourage you to listen to it. It's a beautiful song. It actually describes the Emmett Fitzgerald's last moments. The other alternative is this book that came out, this tape that came out just recently, Gord's Gold 2. It has more songs to it, and it also has the um, wreck of the Emmett Fitzgerald on it. And if you're um, literally inclined, there have been two books put out by it. This one was written, I don't have was a thing on a cover, but it was written by Robert Hemming called Gales of November. It talked to, um, in this book, he talk, actually talks about the individual crewman, tries to best that he can reconstruct the ship's last moments. Um, and also has some photographs of the wreck. One photograph of the ship itself. And also um, tr tries to put a human touch to it. Not only show the ship lost, and that was the end of it. It, 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 it actually talked about the, about the lives that had been lost in this um, great tragedy. Uh, many crewmen who were going to retire that year and people who are just in their mid twenties, getting a uh, start in their uh, just getting a start in their career, and yet, in once one in a blink of an eye, their life was snuffed out. 
But this is the book I really would recommend. It's called Wreck of the Emmett Fitzgerald by Frederick Stonehouse. It's been updated over the years. Um, it actually shows a copy of the um, Coast Guard report. Um, it actually shows even more photographs, both, uh, some debris that's been brought up, some other ships that have been lost on the Great Lakes. Um, it shows several photographs of the Emmett Fitzgerald. And, and the main difference is the uh, Frederick Stonehouse book is factual, Hemings book is more human. But, but at the same time that Stonehouse does facts, he actually tells you what he thinks is wrong with um, the current Coast Guard system, how it, how it took them so long just to get a helicopter out there, how their equipment was out of date, how they would dismiss theories for ridiculous reasons. I, I think it'd be excellent reading, and I would encourage you to re read it. And also, I don't have it with me, but this library has a video called The Wreck of the Emmett Fitzgerald. I have it in my own library. Um, it actually shows Frederick Stonehouse in there, as well as a, a video of the wreck, um, the theories that have been put forth. And I would encourage you to um, check it out as soon as you can. The Great Lakes are, are probably the a haven for the um, sh uh, the many ships that have been lost. But the one I like to think of most is the Emmett Fitzgerald, the one wreck that probably stands out in more minds than any other. For for all the facts that I've just stated and maybe many others. Well, that's all I got. I hope you enjoy the show. And how I hope you'll remember the 29 crewmen that have lost their lives in the tragedy. And you'll listen to Gordon Lightfoot's song and these two books I've recommended. I, I thank, thank you for your time and have a good day. Mm -hmm.